Today we're going to talk about transition metals and then something is related to transition metals but will actually become more useful later on and that's called oxidation number. Transition metals are really common in ionic compounds, things like iron and titanium, those metals that come in the middle of the periodic table, sort of the valley of the periodic table. They have often more than one possible charge state and so it's important to know how to deal with that. Now there are some exceptions. There are three elements that we can count on in the transition metals to have a consistent charge. One of them is silver. When silver is an ion, it's always a 1 plus. Another one is zinc. When zinc is an ion, it's always 2 plus. And then a third one that's consistent is cadmium. Cadmium is always 2 plus when it's an ion. Otherwise, there's more than one state of charge for these different metals. How do we know what the charge is on a metal? Well, there's two methods depending on what where we're starting from. The first method is if we know the formula of the compound we can figure it out by looking at the anion. Because compounds are neutral this allows us to figure this out. The first thing we want to do is determine the total negative charge that's present because of the anion or anions that are present in the compound. And then the cation has to balance that charge and so that dictates what the cation's charge must be. Here's an example. Say we have this formula CuCl2. Well this is obviously made of copper and chloride. Now chloride has a consistent ionic charge because it's a group 7, it's always a 1 minus. There are two of them, so 2 times 1 minus, that means the total negative charge in this compound is 2 minus. Well the total positive charge must also be 2 plus to balance that, and so that means our one copper atom here must have a 2 plus charge on it. So that figures out the charge for us. Here's another example, Fe2O3. Oxygen is a group 6. Oxygens have 2 minus when they're an ion. But we have 3 of them here in this compound because of the subscript 3. So that means our total negative charge is 6 minus. Well that means our positive charge must be 6 plus as well. But that's divided among 2 irons because it's Fe2. So if we take this and divide it by the subscript of the iron, divide it into the number of irons that we have, we find out that each iron must be a 3 plus charge. Here's another example. This involves a polyatomic anion. NO3 is nitrate. If you look it up on your polyatomic ion sheet, or soon you'll know these by heart, nitrate is NO3 1 minus. There are three of them. So that means we have a total negative charge here of 3 minus. That means our positive charge must also be 3, and it's 3 plus to balance. So our single chromium atom has a 3 plus charge. Work this one out. What's the charge on the metal in CuNO3? Well, here's your answer. NO3 is nitrate. Nitrate has a 1 minus charge, and there's one of them. So the total negative charge is 1 minus. That means the total positive charge is 1 plus, and there's one copper atom, so it's a copper 1 plus ion. Try this one. What's the charge on the metal in CoCl2? What's the charge on the cobalt? Well, here's your answer. Chloride is 1 minus because it's a halogen. There are two of them, so that gives us a total charge of 2 minus. The cobalt must provide a 2 plus charge, and so our single cobalt atom must be cobalt 2 plus. Try this one. What's the charge on the iron in FeSO4? Here's your answer. Sulfate, SO4, has a 2 minus charge. There's one of them, so our total negative charge here is 2 minus. That means our single iron atom must provide a 2 plus charge, so it's Fe2 plus. What's the charge on the lead in lead acetate? Well, acetate, C2H3O2, is a 1 minus ion. We have two of them, so that gives us a total negative charge of 2 minus. The lead must then balance that, so we have lead 2 plus because there's only one atom of lead. Here's another one. What's the charge on the gold? in this gold nitrate. We've seen nitrate before, NO3 1 minus. There are three of them here, so that gives us a total negative of 3 minus from the anions. We have one gold atom, it must have a charge of 3 plus to balance. This one's a little bit trickier. Find the charge on the metal in titanium with oxygen here. Well, here's your answer. Oxygen is 2 minus, and we have two of them because of the subscript 2. So that means our total negative charge is 4 minus. Now, if I look at titanium, 
that single atom must have a 4 plus to balance. The second method we use if we have a name rather than a formula, and this is called the stock system. In the stock system of naming ions, a Roman numeral is placed after the name of the metal in parentheses to indicate what its charge is. So for example, iron with a Roman numeral 3, well, that's Fe with a 3 plus charge. Here's an example of a, a name of an entire compound, copper 2 sulfate. Well, because we have a 2 plus in there, that means Cu2 plus. And we know sulfate is SO4 2 minus, and so the formula for this would end up being CuSO4. Okay, you try this one. What's the formula of copper 2 nitrate? Here's your answer. Copper 2 means it's 2 plus. You look up nitrate on your polyatomic ion sheet, you find out that it's NO3 with a 1 minus charge. When we charge swap, copper gets a 1, nitrate gets the subscript 2, and we put parentheses around it. Try this one. Find the formula of manganese 4 oxide. Well, here's your answer. The manganese here has got a 4 plus charge because the Roman numeral 4 indicates that. Oxide, well, that's an oxygen atom. As an ion, that's a 2 minus. So when I do charge swap, the MN gets a 2 and the O gets a 4. Now, because this is an ionic compound, I'm going to reduce those subscripts to their lowest values. So dividing both of them by 2 gives me MN1O2. What's the formula of cobalt 2 chloride? Here's your answer. Cobalt 2 means the cobalt's got a 2 plus charge. Chloride, 1 minus because it's a column 7. So when I charge swap, Cu, Co, Cl2. Here's cobalt chloride. What's the formula of iron 3 oxide? Here's your answer. Iron has 3 plus here because of the Roman numeral. Oxide is 2 minus. So when I charge swap, Fe gets the 2, O gets the 3, and there's the formula for iron 3 oxide. What's the formula of lead 2 nitrate? Well, lead 2 means PB2 plus. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion, 1 minus charge. So when I charge swap, PB gets a 1. We don't write 1s. Nitrate gets a 2. So I enclose it in parentheses because it's a polyatomic before I put the 2. Let's do a few of these backwards. Try this one. Give the name for CuNO3. Well, here's your answer. NO3 is a 1 minus. There's one of them, so that means the total negative charge is 1 minus, so my copper must be 1 plus. So I would write copper 1 in Roman numerals and then nitrate. Remember, it's just cation anion. That's how we name these things. Name Fe2SO4-3. Well, sulfate is SO4-2 minus, and we've got three of them here, so that gives me a total of 6 minus in this compound. So there has to be 6 plus to balance that, and there are two irons to divide that among, so that means each iron has a 3 plus charge. So when I write the name of this, I would write iron 3, because it's a 3 plus ion, and then the name of the anion, sulfate. PBO2, this one's a little tricky. Here's your answer. I know that oxygen is a 2 minus ion. There are two of them here. So that means my total negative charge is 4 minus. That means my lead must be 4 plus. Mm -hmm. So I write down lead, Roman numeral 4, and then oxide. Name Cr NO3, 3. Here's your answer. Nitrate, NO3, is a 1 minus. We've got 3 of them. So that means 3 minus charge. So the chromium must be 3 plus. So when I write the name, I write chromium, Roman numeral 3, and then the name of the anion, nitrate, CuCO3. Here's your answer. CO3, 2 minus, is a polyatomic ion, carbonate. Because it's a 2 minus charge, and there's one of them, the total negative is 2 minus. So the total positive must be 2 plus, so the copper here has got to be Cu2 plus. So I write the name, copper, Roman numeral 2, and then carbonate is the name of the anion. One more, TiO2. 
oxide ion is 2 minus. We've got two of them. So that means a total of 4 minus. The titanium, to balance that, must be 4 plus. So when I write the name, it's titanium 4 oxide. The last topic for today is something called oxidation numbers. Oxidation numbers are a way of keeping track of where the electrons are going. This is fairly easy to do with monatomic ions. Like, for example, if we have a sodium with its one dot and it becomes an Na plus ion, well, it lost an electron. If we have a chloride with its seven dots and it became a Cl minus, well, it must have gained one electron into there. So loss and gain of electrons in monatomic ions is easy. But if you have species that are molecular or species that have more than two atoms in them, it's a little harder. And so we have this formal way of keeping track. I hate to do this to you because it's sort of displaced from anything important, but this seems like the good place to start working with oxidation numbers. Later on, this will make more sense when we use it in the context of uh, a type of reaction, but it'll be too hard to throw all that at you at once later on. So just go through these rules with me, just arbitrarily apply these rules, and later on it'll start to make more sense when you begin using it in context. Here are the rules for assigning oxidation numbers. First of all, the oxidation number of any uncombined element is zero. So if you had, for example, iron, Fe, that would be oxidation number of zero, or sodium, Na, oxidation number zero. Even if you have a diatomic, like H2 or O2, those oxidation numbers are zero if they're uncombined with any other element. The second rule is the oxidation number of any monatomic ion is equal to its charge. So let's say you had sodium 1 plus. Well, its oxidation number is also 1 plus. Or if you had chloride 1 minus, its oxidation is also 1 minus. So oxidation number and charge are the same for monatomic ions. The oxidation number of fluorine in a compound is always minus 1, whether or not it's an ionic compound. The oxidation number of oxygen in a compound is almost always negative 2. Not always. Here are the two exceptions. There are a couple of rare ions. One is peroxide, which is O2, 2 minus. And in that case, the oxidation number of oxygen is minus 1. And the other one is superoxide, which is O2, 1 minus. In this case, the oxidation number is a minus 1 half, which is a little weird. You won't see superoxide. That's very rare. Peroxide, you might see once in a while. Peroxide is actually on your polyatomic ion sheet. The oxidation number of hydrogen in a compound is almost always plus 1. There's only one exception, and that's what we call a metal hydride. When hydrogen is in a binary compound with a metal, it has a 1 minus charge. Another rule that's very helpful is this. In a molecule, the sum of all the oxidation numbers for all the atoms have to add up to 0. So you'll have some pluses, you'll have some minuses, but the sum will add up to 0. Here's an example. Say we had carbon dioxide, CO2. The oxidation number of oxygen is usually minus 2, and that would be no exception here. Well, 2 minus 2 is minus 4, so that means the oxidation number on carbon must be 4, because in the whole molecule, it has to add up to 0. This is a related rule. The sum of oxidation numbers for all atoms in a polyatomic ion has to equal the charge on the ion. The charge on a molecule is zero, and so that's why the last rule added up to zero. Here, the sum of oxidation numbers has to be equal to the charge on the ion. Here's an example. Let's say we were doing carbonate, CO3, 2 minus. Oxygen, again, is a minus 2 oxidation number, and there's three of them. So that gives you negative 6 for oxidation count. It has to all add up to negative 2. So what plus negative 6 is negative 2. Well, positive 4 is the answer. So that means that our carbon here must have a plus 4 oxidation state. Okay, let's try applying this to a real ion, MnO4, 1 minus. Let's assign oxidation numbers. Well, first of all, we know in this ion that oxygen is going to be minus 2, except for the rare exceptions of superoxide and peroxide. Oxygen has a consistent negative 2. Negative 2 4 times is negative 8. The oxidation number for the manganese has to add to negative 8 and give you the charge on the ion, which is negative 1. So that means the manganese must have a plus 7 oxidation number. 
Notice how I'm putting the oxidation numbers up above the atoms and circling them. I do that to keep track of what's oxidation number and what's charge. The minus here I haven't circled. Here's a compound. Assign oxidation numbers to all atoms in CuSO4. Well, this is an ionic compound, so the first thing I'm going to do is split it up into its ions. The first one must be copper 2, because CuSO4 is a 1 to 1 with sulfate, which is an SO4 2 minus. Now, copper is a monatomic ion here, so its oxidation number is the same as its charge, which is 2 plus. In sulfate, I have oxygen, which is negative 2. Negative 2 4 times gives me minus 8. But the total charge on the ion is minus 2, so the sulfur must be positive 6, because positive 6 and, po and negative 8 have to add up to the total charge, which is negative 2. So I'm going to assign sulfur a plus 6 oxidation number. Try this one, UF6. Here's your answer. This is an ionic compound because it's metal, nonmetal, so I'll split it. The uranium must be 6 plus here because fluorines are 1 minus ions. Fluorine is always minus 1. The uranium is a monatomic ion, and so its oxidation number is equal to its charge, which is 6 plus. Fe2O3. Well, this is an ion, so I'll split metal versus nonmetal. The anion is oxygen, which is a 2 minus charge, and the cation here is Fe3 plus. And we can figure that out by kind of reversing the charge swap like we did before. Well, these are both monatomic ions, so the oxidation number for iron is 3 plus, the oxidation number for oxygen is 2 minus. Try this one, H2SO4. Now this is a molecule. This isn't a ionic compound, so I can't split it up. I'll just have to assign oxidation numbers to everything that's present there. Well, I have oxygen, which is usually minus 2. I have hydrogen, which is usually plus 1. Sulfur is the thing that I don't know about at this point. Well, I have two hydrogens, so that's a total of two pluses. I have four oxygens, and they're each minus two, so that's a total of negative eight. Then I'm going to add to it whatever the charge is on sulfur, and that has to add up to zero because this is a molecule. Well, two minus eight is negative six, so that means my sulfur has got to be positive six. So I'm assigning that an oxidation number of plus six. HNO3. Here's your answer. I have a hydrogen, which is going to be a plus one. I have oxygens, which are going to be minus two. So one hydrogen gives a plus one. Three oxygens gives a negative six, plus whatever the nitrogen is has to add up to zero because it's a molecule. So one minus six is negative five, so that means my N must be a positive five here. So I'm assigning that oxidation number to nitrogen.